So good evening and uh, welcome to Dialogues. I'm happy to have Gaurav Ghosh with us today. Gaurav is a visiting faculty of liberal arts with Narsi Monji Institute of Management Studies, Mumbai. And he also teaches Bengali language and culture at Ashoka University. Now, apart from his academic uh, personality, he's also the first uh, gay, uh, gay contest for elections in JNU. He is a queer right activist and a theater artist as well. Apart from that, he's also pursuing his PhD in theater studies from JNU. Now, uh, today, Gaurav will be talking about his lens and experience of queer activism. He will talk about the issues, challenges, and objectives of queer collectives on in Indian university campuses, and how these collectives can play an important role to strengthen the queer movement in India. And therefore, uh, the topic for today's talk is uh, Campus Queer Collectives, Awareness, Inclusivity, and Dissectionality. Now, we also have Ita Lahari with us. She is the secretary of Arenda, which is a queer collective of IIT Gandhinagar itself. And apart from that, she's also an MA student in society and culture. Uh, she's a final year student. So uh, we will start the talk now. And Gaurav, uh, we'll have a talk for another, for uh, to 35 minutes and then it will be followed by a question and answer session of course we'll have further discussions as well and i really look forward to hearing you and to your experiences so thank you so much for accepting the invitation and the floor is all yours uh, thank you bhavna uh, for uh, organizing this and uh, thank you to iit gandhinagar to help uh, the students to um, run a platform like dialogues and uh, so uh, thank you all of you for coming uh, after your you know, academic and professional engagements and to listen to me and to have a discussion uh, with all of us about uh, how to make IIT Gandhinagar campus uh, more inclusive and uh, uh, queer friendly. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, friends and comrades from Horenda so uh, it would be interesting to uh, and also very educating to know how orenda functions on the iit gandhinagar campus what uh, obviously i have done a little bit of research on orenda and have found out uh, not only on the term orenda but also um, on the club and it's a uh, gender sexuality club uh, which is almost like I felt like uh, it was modeled after the uh, Gender Sexuality Association, TSA, uh, which is very uh, popular and quite strong in the United States. And TSA has a very good presence across uh, uh, high junior school and high school uh, high schools in the United States. So, uh, Bhav, uh, so Bhavna has asked me that, you know, that I should... Uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, gender, sexuality, queer uh, struggles, uh, you know, and how it uh, started in India and how the campus queer collectives can actually uh, help uh, others to actually understand what is gender, what is sexuality, what is what do we mean by queer and, uh, and what it means actually to ha uh, talk about queer rights. So uh, it will be more uh, anecdotal, it will be more experiential rather than giving a uh, more informative lecture. And I'm assuming that uh, most of you are already aware of uh, several milestones which are uh, in the history of queer struggles across the world. So uh, I'm not going to talk in detail that how it started with Stonewall rights in the United St States and it gave birth to something called gay liberation uh, movement in the United States and then slowly it uh, spread uh, across uh, 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 you know, the planet and then how it actually uh, influenced several other uh, you know, social movements and particularly movements related to gender and sexuality rights. Uh, it would be interesting because all these information you can Google, you can find out, you can see that how um, Latinos, uh, how uh, black people, uh, they actually, uh, you know, spearheaded the movement. And also when we talk about, you know, uh, you're all um, uh, in a, uh, engineering um, uh, 
it's, it's a campus which is dedicated to engineering mostly. So you are all aware of uh, you know disco music, house music, and all these things. And uh, if you look at the history of all these, it is all uh, it, it has a very strong queer origins. You know, and I have recently organized a talk with one of my friends in Banaras, and he he's from America, and he talked about it and. It is fascinating to know that how uh, disco music or dance music or house music they uh, developed uh, in an environment which is uh, shaped and nurtured by uh, queer people of color. Now, while listening to this particular talk, I have realized that it is important for uh, us who we are. Like I'm, a, I, I'm, I, I call myself a, a gay man. So for queer people to actually document all these stories and histories and to talk about it, to let people know the histories, the struggles, the stories of queer people. Now, how we do it, like unless and until we become researchers or we become activists, we become, you know, uh, catalogers, we cite catalog, we try to register each and everything, record each and everything, and then try to promote it. I think here the uh, campus square collectives, or let's say even school level square collectives, are very important because if, uh, let's say, uh, for example, I know of one school in India, Tagore International in Delhi, and they are running their uh, school collective, square collective, for years now. And they participate also in the Delhi Queer Pride. Uh, and they, and if you interact with the students, so they will tell you their members are from class 7 till class 12. And, one, and they have several programs, there are several objectives. One of the objectives is obviously to, uh, you know, uh, document what they are doing as school children and also as queer. One, another objective is to talk to their parents about sexuality, because we all know that in India, sex education is not taught in uh, schools, you know, and it's a very difficult job because uh, we don't have trained counselors and trained teachers who can actually teach uh, sex education in schools. And obviously, that's why we cannot also convince parents that, you know, sex education is not only about having, how, not only talking about how to have sex, but how to have safe sex. It also talks about sexual health programs. It talks about various things related to sex and sexuality. So uh, that's a huge problem. So Tegor International uh, School Square Collective also uh, takes up this job to actually educate and aware the parents to know what is gender and sexuality, what do we mean by gender expressions, and how uh, they can support uh, a queer child. Like if there is a student of class 9 or 10 who is coming out, how parents can actually, uh, you know, uh, become the support system for that student. So I so while interacting with them, I have also realized that these students, when they go to university or these colleges, it is important that they also carry this legacy with them or this tradition of collectives, you know, with them and to uh, uh, make people uh, aware of, you know, like wherever they are going in the education institutions. I come from JNU, and JNU had a queer collective, first queer collective called uh, um, uh, third. The recent one is Hasrate, the second one is Dhanak, and the first one was Anjuman. And Anjuman started with queer film screenings, and it all started. You know, JNU is apparently, uh, uh, and it is actually a uh, uh, very progressive. It's uh, a very left-leaning campus. But just imagine in 2003, 4, 5, but during this time, your JNU campus, people were not, and these are, you know, left students were also not talking about the uh, queer issues. It is interesting to note that uh, when FIRE, the film, which was released, and which almost, you know, we call it the FIRE moment of LGBT struggles in India, where uh, the LGBT individuals in India got mobilized and polarized and they got together and they started talking about um, sexuality rights in India. Same year, there was another film called Tamanna, which was also released, you know, and which actually got uh, uh, national recognition. And 
after this entire fiasco that happened with the release of fire and the uh, several outfits of the right wing uh, political parties you know constantly vandalizing cinema halls and attacking queer people it is interesting to note that the first politician who actually uh, came out openly and said that section 377 should go was brinda karat you know from communist party of india marxist and uh, obviously uh, she was the first uh, politician and perhaps the first uh, woman obviously of uh, being a straight woman uh, talking about these uh, you know about queer allies and talking about section 377 and then genuine uh, incident happened which actually saw a queer collective coming up but then that queer collective obviously uh, faced lot of harassments on campus again from the right wing uh, uh, student bodies and uh, they were harassed their uh, doors of their hostel rooms were uh, uh, had posters uh, 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 you know homophobic slurs the homophobic slurs and everything it was quite uh, uh, difficult for them to also run that queer collective for long and very few uh, progressive left student organizations actually supported them or brought out pamphlets in um, you know in their uh, favor and now when and then i entered jnu campus in 2006 to do my masters and then i uh, and, and people used to talk about anjuman by that time anjuman was dead by that time anjuman almost was it was almost like a name which was buzzing on campus it took me for some years some months to also understand my sexuality as because jnu gave me that space and my students and my uh, friends actually uh, supported me and created the space for me to actually uh, have build that confidence that okay i am gay and i can be what uh, who i am and uh, and my faculty obviously on campus started supporting me it took me several uh, months actually to come out openly uh, as a gay man on campus and then we started and then i found my own tribe you know of queer uh, students and then i started, uh, started we started talking about how to uh, organize things and i remember that i uh organized a film screening by my very dear friend debolina who is also part of sapo for equality which is eastern india's first lgbt organization and i uh, screened debolina's two very interesting films and uh, my entire department english department supported me like all my uh, junior batch my senior batch my own batch so and uh, faculty and also the linguistic department and a few other friends and a lot of students came to watch both the films and i had a register i still have the register and uh, you it would be shocking to know that these students were um jnu students and they were writing uh, very interesting comments that uh, uh, only eastern part of india which is quote unquote feminized or feminine has only gay men you know other parts of india are more masculine and homosexuality does not exist in other part of india so uh, it, it was interesting to see how uh, why and how these people uh, you know were writing such uh, statements but then i realized that it is important for uh, me to start doing something on campus to let people know that homosexuality is not a crime first of all and it does not only exist in the eastern part of india not only with bengalis because bengalis like me can be a little more performative and loud because we are confident for as we are dramatic but that does not mean that homosexuality is only in the eastern part of india and so a uh, couple of friends uh, we came together and we formed jnu second queer collective called dhanak and we made it a point that we would actually start releasing uh, pamphlets and posters in support of other issues that the other student bodies are also raising particularly let's say fee issue like you know a high uh, like fee hike and we would also support uh, students who are actually uh, fighting against it we would also uh, fight for gs cash which is very unfortunately now no more existing on campus uh, we would actually uh, so we will try to talk about intersectionality and we were very clear that what do we mean by intersectional politics and with whom we can actually 
form intersectional politics. And uh, so uh, one of the uh, uh, things that I have learned from my uh, association with SAFO for Equality was that I have seen SAFO for uh, volunteers of SAFO for Equality uh, boarding local trains, you know, local trains which uh, come from the suburbs, like uh, uh, like from Sundarban area to Calcutta, bringing every day the uh, domestic help, you know, from the suburbs to the city. I have seen uh, the volunteers of SAFO for Equality boarding this train and distributing pamphlets written in Bengali and telling these village women that, you know, that if you find a girl in your village who has boys cut hair, who rides bike and who is not quote unquote feminine, please let her know that we are here in the city. This is our address. This is our phone number, you know. There is a small uh, keeping also that Devolina has captured, you know, and it is really interesting to see how these women who are perhaps illiterate, who are perhaps daily wage laborers, so they are coming to the city and they are meeting these square uh, volunteers and they are coming to know that something is there. Perhaps there is a one girl in my village, I can tell her that, okay, fine, we are not like you, but there are other girls who are like you, you can go and meet them. So then I have realized, when I realized this, I have told my friends that, you know, it is important for uh, all of us to translate our pamphlets into Hindi. Because we are actually in North India, we are in Delhi, and we are, uh, you know, talking to an English speaking person about queer rights is okay. But we need to, because in India, queer struggle is very much restricted to the urban area. So it is important for us to also go out, go beyond this, you know, uh, uh, urbanity, and we should also reach out to people. You know, you can imagine I'm a Bengali and I can't read Hindi. And if you ask me to talk about Samlingita in Hindi, it would be a catastrophe. But still, I uh, learned, and we had uh, very interesting, very exciting, very brilliant uh, volunteers who actually came up with a lot of interesting terminologies, and we used to translate our, all our English pamphlets into Hindi pamphlets also. And that actually changed a lot on JNU campus, you know, like if you go and talk to some old uh, non-teaching staff on JNU campus and if you mention my name, they would say, oh, uh, sex neta hai. I don't know what my Hindi did, but this is what this identity I have uh, achieved, you know. And But I used to go to them and I used to tell them, obviously in my broken Hindi, that, you know, that this is the, uh, these are the issues that we want to, uh, we are fighting for and we want to, to come and support us. So uh, I organized uh, with a couple of friends, uh, JNU's uh, uh, Queer Film Festival and this JNU's first Queer Film Festival called Satra. We did two editions and a third edition, obviously, we couldn't do it because, you know, uh, Umar Khalid, Kanaya, that incident happened and we're our friends, even if we have political differences, but if they are our friends, if our friends are landing up in jail and, um, uh, you know, are inside uh, prison, we cannot actually celebrate something and make something like Queer Film Festival unless until we are also trying to make something with a political statement. So we couldn't do it. And then after that, you obviously, uh, some of you must be knowing it, that how JNU has been constantly under attack and we are constantly fighting um, a lot of uh, things. So that's why the third edition couldn't happen. But uh, first edition, I did it on my own, uh, asking for friends from here and there. Second edition, we approved SAFO for Equality, and SAFO for Equality curated and supported, like, uh, like they didn't take any money. They are uh, they organized and they supported the entire film festival. But uh, second in the second edition, I thought that Campus Square Collective means not only students, it also means that it should have queer teachers and non-teaching staff who are also queer, you know, and non-teaching staff means who are contractual and who are permanent, both. So I so I, uh, I proposed this uh, idea to my uh, queer folks and then they also agreed and they accepted this proposal. I said, we need to reach out to these people and we need to have a panel discussion. Because when we talk about, uh, let's say, if you talk about IIT Gandhi Nagar Queer Collective, you have a club, and the club primarily functions for students. But let's say, if you have a queer collective, you cannot only restrict that space to only students, according to me. You know, the space should be open up to also teaching and non-teaching staff. 
the space should be also i don't know uh, the, the you know the geography of iit gandhinagar's campus but jnu uh, campus has a neighborhood called munirka which is just opposite the campus lot of jnu students who don't get hostels and who also are jnu pass out and they are looking for uh, jobs or they are preparing for something they eventually land up staying in munirka it is cheap it is affordable the campus is nearby you can always come and chill out with your uh, friends you can meet your faculty so my objective was also that if you have a queer collective campus queer collective and you if you have a neighborhood like munirka which is just opposite to your uh, campus it is important that you should also reach out to that neighborhood because your campus is also extended to that neighborhood so because your all your students are living in that neighborhood so it is important for the campus collectives and campus student bodies also to make sure that the neighborhood is safe and inclusive because in that neighborhood like for example in munirka we face lot of homophobic and casteist and also sexist uh, you know comments and incidents also happen for example one of my juniors uh, she was uh, renting a flat there and she came uh, back at 1:30 from the library you know and she was not a student of jnu she was appearing applying for abroad and she came she was studying uh, like she was preparing something in jnu and she reached her place at 1:30 and this uh, and we were also with her to uh, see her off and we were coming back and suddenly we heard that one of the tenants in her building started calling her a uh, sex worker and saying that you come back at 1:30 you are a girl how can you come back at 1:00 he was drunk so then we thought that you know why this kind of incidents will happen you know and uh, so so uh, so what i did was that i started uh, making these small small groups and we started talking to local people also during the second edition of jnu queer film festival sasan so uh, we had two days panel discussion one day we had a panel discussion with jnu uh, queer collective jnu student union and all the campus queer collectives from delhi region you know from ashoka university from shivnadar from uh, jamia from ambedkar university from delhi university from iit delhi we had this long uh, panel discussion and we tried to talk about that how we can have this kind of network in delhi city uh, in the city uh, you know am through this square collectives the second panel uh, discussion that we had on the second day was uh, uh, you know uh, asking lot of other bodies to come for example uh, teaching uh, staff association and non teaching staff association you know so uh, jnu ta which is jnu university teachers association so they sent one representative the staff association is very interesting and why i am mentioning it because i went and uh, i went with the appeal i went with our uh, request letter application and our poster and the film poster also and uh, the staff association member uh, gave me a time and said okay you can come this time and i could obviously see it's very uneasiness because he must have heard of gay man or a gay boy or you know or a lesbian but looking at them in front of him and almost they are shaking hands with him he was little uh, you know surprised that oh these people also exist actually in reality but he was very sweet he said that we have seen your application but we are unable to take a call we have all agreed to the fact that uh, this is important and perhaps all of you are uh, saying the right thing but we don't know whether we can actually come and join because we are still debating i think it's very nice that you are still debating because at least they have started talking about it and later i have come to know that some of the uh, women non uh, teaching staff and um, uh, uh, dalit non teaching staff they raised this question and he said that why can't we have intersectional politics with them you know and uh, later we came to know that one of the non teaching staff in jnu staff association uh, uh, was queer and that's why you know they got that chance you know when they saw our application because i asked them a simple question that you know now after nalsa judgment if if there is one transgender uh, employee coming to the campus let's say as a uh, house cleaning staff or as a mess worker you know is there is no gender neutral toilet on campus 
where will that person go because now by law by uh, you know by the provision you have to take one if somebody applies and qualifies but but where that person will go it's the same thing i have asked our earlier jnu uh, vice chancellor dr sapuri and um, it's very interesting uh, that dr sapuri uh, did not uh, support the jnu queer film festival the first edition you know Uh, i was called by the administration i was told by the administration that the administration is withdrawing support from the festival because lot of people had written to the administration to stop the film festival they said is anti indian culture they said that it is uh, anti jnu spirit and the jnu campus has also resident it's a residential campus where lot of uh, families also stay on campus of teaching and non teaching stuff they do not want their children and family members introduced to this kind of disgusting films you know and uh, uh, the uh, cultural coordinator uh, who was from a language department at that time on campus and she used to really like me she called me and she said no we will not support it and uh, i went to dr sapuri dr sapuri said no we cannot you know and suddenly i was you know i i am um, uh, i'm also an actor i was extremely popular on campus as a theater person and so every time i went with this kind of appeal i was always accepted i was well, uh, my everybody listened to my um, appeal and everything but that time i saw that nobody was listening to me It took me almost one year to slowly go and talk to all of these people and saying that you know what i actually want second edition the day it it uh, it was it ended dr sapuri you know from the vice chancellor's office there is was one mail which was sent into my email account and i cried and i took a print out of the email and i showed it to all my friends he said that gora we took me some time to understand what is square rights you can understand that i hold a position and a post that's why i cannot come and join but next time when i will be not the vice chancellor and if you guys organize a festival like this i would come you know and and then that moment i felt that this was perhaps you know a, um, a moment of success for us because you know um, uh, your vice chancellor is writing to you and saying very candidly that why the vice chancellor couldn't come and the vice chancellor would come when he would not be the vice chancellor after supporting while leaving the campus a few weeks back he met me on the campus and he uh, asked me that i'm still waiting for your application which you didn't send and i thought that before i leave i could do this because i asked him that sir if there are transgender students coming to campus where would they actually stay if i am a transgender student you can't ask me to stay in a boys hostel or a girls hostel unless and until i recognize as a trans man or a trans woman you know so if i'm still in the transition period why will you put me so uh, there has to be some uh, you know provision you have to talk to uh, student bodies you have to talk to wardens you have to talk to um, uh, psychology you know counselors and then you have to decide that where a transgender student will uh, live on campus because by that time we have a, we had two transgender uh, students on jnu campus and they were not uh, they didn't have the confidence uh, to come out Uh, so they were uh, actually staying in boys hostel and they uh, were not happy while uh, staying in a boys hostel so uh, but obviously this couldn't happen and after that obviously jnu is always in this spree of fighting now against the administration but uh, so these are a few things uh, that happened and another thing i would like to share with you guys uh, we did something called rainbow walk wearing the campus and you can check uh, you know you to google it you will find lot of uh, interesting stories and photographs so uh, we we actually uh, made a rainbow tree on jnu campus uh, to uh, mark one year uh, one uh, the anniversary of uh, this one year uh, uh, anniversary of the recriminalization of section 377 Court and uh, after a few uh, days, uh, that rainbow tree was slit, and uh, so again, uh, students approached me and others, and we called a meeting, and we all decided that we would paint the campus in rainbow colors. And uh, I think from 2005 till 2015. 
pain you never witness that kind of a spontaneous uh, cultural movement because uh, everyone on campus uh, except obviously the right wing uh, they join the movement including teachers students and non teaching staff i personally went to each shop on campus and to uh, collect donations and i told them that this is what we are going to do believe me at everyone you know i don't know if anyone from you are uh, acquainted with jnu campus or not but the, in, on it, on campus there is a interesting place called kc you know kc complex where you get lots of uh, stuff lots of things you know every day um, uh things uh, and so for every shop each shop of that uh, shopping complex they donated money and they said we are with you and uh, so when we started rainbow walk querying the campus from ganga dhaba we had around 200 people the time we reached kc it was almost 400 plus people and 400 plus people singing dancing and painting the campus in rainbow colors and tying rainbow ribbons so uh, uh, that actually and next day obviously the admin sent uh, admin's own uh, team to see if we have vandalized the campus or not but the team was also very queer friendly they had right wing people but they saw the campus looking very colorful and beautiful you know rainbow is very colorful and beautiful so uh, they all said no no the campus is actually looking nice and uh, because what we did was that we said that you know there is a statue of jawala nehru on jnu campus and the statue is like almost like a, like you know it shows that it's walking and so what we did was that we put a uh, rainbow colored footprints from the statue and the footprints went inside the administrative block you know it's as if like uh, nehru was also queerized as well as the campus was queerized so uh, so all these you know moments we st uh, started doing from 2006 uh end onwards till 2015 it happened and that actually uh changed a lot of things uh, on jnu campus the political parties are now forced the student bodies are now forced to actually talk about queer issues uh in their manifesto election manifestos um abb um uh, is also forced to talk about queer issues though they are a bit confused and they talk about lot of uh, things which are um, important for us to note but uh, it is also because uh, there are queer people also in abvp and uh, but they do not want to acknowledge it you know and uh, so one of the uh, interesting things for the campus queer collective is also to reach out to these um, queer people you know who are perhaps politically uh, inclined towards right wing but we need to tell them that uh, and and that's why i keep on repeating this thing because they believe that it is important to smash patriarchy but not capitalism and we need to make them understand that patriarchy and capitalism go hand in hand you know and that's why what is happening right now in india that post section 377 when homosexuality is uh, decriminalized in india lot of upper caste upper class hindu gay men are going to marry their only objective has become now to marry i don't understand as myself as a gay man that this is not what the queer struggle or movement in india should look like that we will only fight for marriage rights we should obviously fight for uh, you know employment fi fight for reservation fight for you know representations but not only i am not against marriage i am saying saying that marriage rights is also important but that cannot be the only objective right now one second is that that uh, you know that once you get the marriage rights it is important for us and as well as for straight people to fight against the institution of marriage because the institution of marriage itself is very exploitative you can or we can we have to fight for civil partnership rights you know civil union should happen you know but not ritual based marriage because these are very exploitative and uh, so uh, and, and why i'm saying that gay people should be little cautious when they are talking about marriage rights because we have been talking about the pink money you know we are talking about you know because capital that is how capitalism also functions because let's say if i am i always give this stereotype um, uh, example but i'm sorry for this 
you know this also comes to me because i have been uh, in, in you know in love with punjabi men uh, so many times you know like not so many like you know like, like just two guys and that's why the punjabi men come to my mind immediately is that just imagine you know a punjabi uh, two punjabi aunties of delhi they have decided that their sons will get married you know and there is a marriage Uh, like our, our wedding event management uh, company, which is saying that okay, aunties, we are very happy that you are accepting your gay sons. We will give you a discount, but let's do this ten day long big fat Indian wedding. It's the same thing that you will do, you know, like same mehendi, same all kind of rituals which are actually regressive. These are rituals sipped in coded languages of exploitation and repression. All these things will happen. so i think as queer at least as campus uh, queer collectives it is also important for us to talk about the issues that we should fight for after section 377 because when 377 is gone and what is going to come in between this uh, two uh, points two moments there is this period of transition this is the most crucial period because we have achieve something we are done with one you know act which criminalized us but then what we are going to have in future we have to decide right now and that we have to do together and there comes intersectionality because i cannot say that i am a queer person so i will not talk about tribal issues you know i am lesbian i can only talk about feminism but i will not talk about uh, transgender issues you know so this kind of uh, you know uh, priorities we should be uh, thinking about you know that why we are thinking that you know we will uh, have will be allies with this particular issue and not this particular issue because as queer people if we talk about justice if we talk about equality then we have to also talk about other marginalized communities it is important for us to remember and keep on remembering that in india as well as in the world queer activist and queer activism was shaped nurtured and groomed by the feminist movements if the feminists if women have been constantly nurturing and supporting us and telling us how to do the activism if i have the time has come for us also to give it back to them to also be with feminist uh, movements and organizations to actually ally with the uh, feminist movements and women movements how many of us actually as queer individuals as campus uh, collectives as uh, uh, you know uh, queer clubs of uh, uh, university indian university campuses actually went on street and to talk about the transgender protection rights bill act which has now become an act the transgender protection rights bill when it was introduced it was a horrible bill how many of us actually went there and uh, fought against the bill and said no this bill has to have it has to have serious amendments now like hardly uh, i could i can say that you know uh, uh, gay people actually went out and supported how many of us are actually going out as you know with the queer flag banner you know and saying that we are against ca nrc how many of us actually took out releases and wrote articles as queer individuals talking about demonetization how many of us actually questioned the indian government that about the pandemic that during the pandemic during the lockdown what happened to the queer people there are transgender people who are sex workers there are gay men who are also sex workers what happened to their uh, sexual health what happened to their occupation because in india obviously sex work is not recognized as a labor but what happened to these uh, queer people who are also sex workers they lost their job what, did like till now the government has not released or announced any special package for transgenders and for queer people lot of queer people are in transition from m to f for or f to m they they are on medication they need nutritious food they need hygienic environment to live in how many of us actually reach out to them one i think lot actually a lot of us actually reach out to them but what the government actually did that is in question lot of us are also hiv uh, patients 
during the lockdown when everything was closed down how we reach out to our queer people friends who are hiv positive and who needed the medicine very interestingly the ngos and i would say that you know hats off to the government medical officers and volunteers and uh, uh, workers in government hospitals who are actually working with hiv because i work with hiv aids so they actually formed an informal network to actually give the medicine to patients the medicines were not stopped and that happened completely unofficially there was no government initiative to actually make sure that you know during this pandemic people are dying migrant workers are walking back hungry people are dying out of hunger but at the same time queer people are also existing what did the government do for these queer people so i think these are some you know concerns and issues which i think that the campus queer collective should keep on thinking talking and we should take up uh, these issues because the pandemic is like the coronavirus is still around it is still going on one second is that we don't know what is going to uh, come in you know in the, uh, later this year or next year this government is privatizing education you know so uh, so all these things will also affect us students like whether we are queer or non queer and definitely lot of policies will affect queer people uh, who are students or who are going to be uh, you know uh, professions very soon so i think the campus queer collectives across indian university campuses should have some kind of coordination some kind of a network or a you know all india based uh, body and we should start developing our own charter of demands and objectives and what we can proposed to the government uh, because section 377 is gone now so you know and the surrogacy uh, law is still intact where uh, the surrogacy law which was passed by shushma swaraj does not allow me to adopt or to does not allow me to have a child through surrogacy you know so uh, and, and let's say suppose if bhavna and i both are transgender you know and and we want to get married you know there are there are uh, provisions where it would be asked that you know one of us has to recognize as a man if that happens then both bhavna and i we lose we lose our identity as a transgender if i'm saying i'm a transgender in bracket man then where does my transgender identity stay you know so all these things and because it is important to again remember that our judiciary the judges the lawyers the policy makers our uh, law makers they do not have a solid and sound knowledge of gender and sexuality and identities it is important for us to educate them to have this continuous awareness programs and campaigns going on and at the same time to make sure that if they do something wrong we as collective voice should also oppose it and start having dialogues so yeah so i will stop here i have spoken a lot and then maybe i can take up some questions thank you thank you gaurav it was really enlightening and uh, yes indeed uh, we still have uh, there are many loopholes in the system and uh, through these i think having a talk like this is also a way to educate and bring a kind of an awareness uh, in the system so yes we have ekta with us and ekta can go ahead with the questions ekta yes hi hi hello am i audible yes okay so first of all gorob thank you so much that was um very interesting very informative insight into the larger uh, scene of queer activism and um, i especially enjoyed um, how you distinguished the scopes of what a queer club and a collective you know is sort of uh, meant to do because ever since i came to iit i was in tis hyderabad before this uh, where i was a part of a queer collective but um, IIT when i came here and i saw orenda is categorized as a gender and sexuality club then um my expectations from it uh, sort of um shifted a bit and then i had to uh 
step back and take a look at what differences are there in the scope of the functions of these organizations. But yeah, that's been on my mind. And, and hearing from you, I think that was uh, interesting. And that was it provided some sort of clarity. Um, I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask, um, if that's all right. So um, first of all, um, again, since I've been a part of um, different queer collectives in different sort of educational institutions, um, this is just this is not even a question. This is sort of me asking for some advice and suggestions about um, how do you really um, try and establish a queer collective or some sort of solidarity in um, mostly technical university where um, people who want to join these collectives, um, even queer people who want to join these collectives uh, do not come out, um, not come out in that sense, sorry, do not come forward because they're constantly afraid of um, sort of being outed without their consent, being uh, bullied by their fellow batchmates. And there is, a, of course, this stems from the lack of gender sensitization, be it in school or even afterwards. But when in the environment of a predominantly technical university, it becomes very difficult to reach out to people without a more nuanced understanding of these issues. And how do we go about that? That is also the primary difficulty I have faced in my last one year of being the secretary and last two years, just being a part of Orenda, I guess. So I think uh, what Orenda can do is that Orenda can have uh, create a space as a club. You know, club means uh, there will be a lot of activities, recreational activities, and people would come out. Uh, like people would come and join the club, you know, and uh, participate in a lot of uh, cultural events. So Orenda can, uh, uh, so if IIT Gandhinagar has one campus square collective, so Orenda can be its sister, uh, sister uh, body, which will take care of the uh, recreational part. And the collective can talk about, uh, you know, uh, research, can talk about uh, more support group, because uh, what you have said, we have also faced a lot of our members also with Ganakas existing. They were not uh, comfortable to come out of the closet. You know, closet is a very Western term, but uh, we come out in very different ways. But uh, and, and we cannot force a person to come out of the closet. But as queer collective, it is also uh, our duty to tell, responsibility to tell the person that to be in the closet is your choice, but not your right. You know, you, 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 your right is that you have to come out of the closet. You should not be afraid of anyone because you, because, and that's why your support system is important and the collective can provide their support system. But obviously coming out is very painful and it's also very traumatic. So every time a person comes out, it is very traumatic for that person. So, but obviously a collective can create that support system and the space where the person can come out gradually. Uh, in a technical uh, campus like IIT Gandhinagar, what, what comes to my mind is that you should, um, uh, one can actually talk about all the queer icons from the science world, you know, like uh, from uh, the Nobel laureates who were queer, you know or uh, great uh, scientists who are queer or who were queer and you can actually do a kind of an exhibition you know you can print out their photograph you can uh, write a, s a small blurb on them and you can actually talk about their uh, great uh, you know achievement or experiment or uh, uh, discovery or invention and then you can have an exhibition and obviously the focus is not only to let the campus people know about science, but also to know about people that yes, a science person is all, was also a queer person. So this can one, this can be one thing. I also think that if you are creating a, an, a, or, or forming a queer collective, the choice of uh, space to, uh, for people to come is very important. Because uh, these I have learned from my queer feminist uh, friends on campus, JNU campus. Because on JNU campus, uh, girls can enter boys' hostel, but boys cannot enter girls' hostel. 
so uh, one of our founders so we used so he gave us his room and we used to go to his room and used to uh, have our uh, monthly meetings one of the uh, one of our friends uh, she told us that why do you uh, assume that as girls we would be very happy and comfortable to enter boys hostel and have this meeting because you are assuming you because you know that you can't enter girls hostel that's why you have given this option we appreciate it but when we Hostel have it. You no, know, uh, remember that you should create a place or a space where everybody can come. And obviously, the question of uh, uh, discretion or the question of you know privacy should be there, uh, there because lot of queer people will not be very comfortable to meet uh, people in uh, public. You know, unless until they are confident enough. Another point is that you should reach out to uh, faculty members and also to uh, administration. And uh, slowly, and there will be a lot of faculty members who will be queer allies or who will be uh, queer uh, themselves. So you can also reach out to them to come and support you. Obviously, faculty members will not uh, be very happy or not be always coming and hawking the student space. They would say, okay, we are supporting, you can have your own space. But it is important for faculty members and administrative members to be also on board because then you will have a support system. Because when you have a, this kind of a queer collective, you should also be mentally prepared that there will be uh, criticisms and there will be also backlashes. So it is good that we will, we are all equipped uh, better in a better way. Yeah. Thank you so much. That that's very helpful. That is um, that gives a lot more perspective into looking into how to make the uh, campus more queer inclusive. And I, I genuinely think it is in the need of some efforts. Uh, it needs to be more inclusive in general and um, i'd also like to ask other participants if they have any questions could you please uh, put those in the chat box um yeah and uh, yeah please put in the chat box if possible and in the meantime there's another question i'd like to ask you and that is a little more uh, i think that's a little more guided by my personal experience with queer collectives again be it in tis or in iit so um i understand um the importance of allyship and the importance of <clears throat> having uh, cis head allies um, for the queer movement. But um, a lot of times in very progressive student spaces, in very progressive left leaning student spaces, what I've seen, what I've been part of is pride marches um, led by uh, upper caste, upper class, cis head men. And uh, the, because that would also grant these uh, marches and movements larger visibility. But in given the larger picture, what sort of precedent would that then set for queer movements within these spaces? I Again, I'm not denying the importance of allyship, but who gets to be visible and who gets to make what visible is, I think, an important concern. So your observation is... Um very valid ekta and you know i am a, uh, uh, i am uh, i am um, i am from uh, student federation of india and uh, i support uh, communist party of india marxist and my dream is uh, to see uh, our uh, workers association which is c2 holding the red flag and the queer flag together you know for me my dream come true i pride march would be that the uh, left workers union leading the uh, Pride March in one of the cities in India. Because, uh, and this is what I have been uh, telling uh, to my uh, uh, party, you know, uh, whenever I get the opportunities that uh, there cannot be any hierarchy in deciding the issues, you know, because uh, what is this guarantee and what kind of understanding is that, that a 
uh, worker is not queer like a auto driver who is running his auto rickshaw can also be lesbian or gay or bisexual or transgender so the workers rights is also the queer rights you know and today as i'm discussing with you guys uh, the election is happening in uh, west bengal and today uh, in the uh, 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 the, uh, the workers union uh, building which is beside the mothers house in calcutta the uh, left uh, uh, candidates of the city calcutta and also suburbs they are coming to the city today and they are meeting the queer uh, organizations from west bengal to talk about that if uh, what left uh, candidates or or left leaders if they are elected what they can do for the queer people and this is what uh, cpim has been doing for a few years now and i am happy that you know because when i was uh, fielded by sfi as uh, jnu's first gay man uh, to, to contest the election so i was also supported by um, uh, cpim you know and uh, as ekta as you have po rightly pointed out i got support from all left parties and i have to be very specific that i got support from the women comrades and cadres of all left parties the men uh, and this these are these are obviously cis het men and leftist men from different left parties they were not supportive and there were all scandalous uh, campaign against me but not a single woman comrade said until now you know i contested in 2013 and this is 2021 until today i have never heard from anybody that a woman comrade has said anything bad or anything you know uh, personal against me it was only the cis het men who did it but yes we need uh, people to help uh, us uh, for example in calcutta and also in delhi queer pride marches when the mncs want to give us money you know for uh, printing uh, leaflets making banners we always ask them that will you sign in our release and our release talks about uh, tribal rights our release talks about minimum wage our release talks about sexual harassment at workplace guidelines if you are an mnc and if you have all these provisions and if you accept and if you are with us then you give us the money we will be happily we will happily take your money for our pride march but if you are not then we cannot take the money and please don't come with your banner to our pride march so i think this we have to be very strong very affirmative and very clear on this point that we will not allow this kind of forces to come and join us and then take our spaces in this context i would request all of you if you have not watched please watch the film pride and uh, where you will see the workers uh, uh, the, the the mine workers of england they led one of the pride marches of uh, london and uh, it's obviously based on a true event and it's a great film so please watch it and uh, yeah thank you so much so um i'll once again like if we do not have any questions from the audience maybe we can wrap up the session bhavna yeah i think we can do that yes so any questions from the faculties or students yeah faculty members i can only see one faculty who is also i think from jnu but i don't want to name but i think i have seen your faculty also on campus okay <laughs> Yeah, uh, Bhavna, am I audible? Yeah, yes, yes you are. Nilesh. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, sir. Like uh, for a, such a wonderful talk and like enlighten us. So uh, my question is like a little tricky. It's not uh, just about uh, your personalities, but uh, they're like siblings. So I'm just trying to understand the uh, as we uh, know, ki uh, largely. indian marriage system is based on like patriarchal uh, system so uh, and in that way when we like in normal case when we uh, started looking groom or bride 
so we also like indian category society people also do uh, think about if they are carrying any genetic uh, genetic disease or not like uh, such as like some skin diseases or diabetes people do think about that okay so my question is like when people understand ki okay he sibling is like uh, to a personality and the, in that case the sibling of the two personality face any like uh, negative uh, like uh, uh, like sense of uh, like from society okay uh <laughs> yeah so, nilesh i just i'm trying to understand the social impact on siblings uh, because our society is not yet ready to accept like uh, uh, what we are discussing means they need to educate right now but uh, still we are going through the situation or a phase so i'm just trying to uh, try understand the situation what they are like siblings are going through so nilesh i don't know how to answer this because i have never thought about it uh, uh, because i think if uh, if one of the partners is square let's say if uh, if a bisexual man is married to a uh, heterosexual uh, like a heterosexual woman and if they give birth to uh, children their children uh, can be uh, queer or cannot be queer also it like like uh, bisexual orientation so uh, it uh, there are scientific uh, now there are scientific explanations and maybe ekta can actually organize uh, a series uh, you know of uh, you know how science explains the dna genes and you know all these things in uh, context of uh, homosexuality but uh, i don't know that whether uh, as you are saying that how it influences people genetically i have no uh, answer actually a scientific answer to uh, give uh, rather i would say that uh, in india lots of men and women are bisexual and uh, i know lot of uh, men and women who are uh, bisexual and they are married and they are open to uh, their partners who are bisexual or maybe not bisexual i appreciate that i don't appreciate when a bisexual man uh, or a gay man let's say um, uh, is forced to marry or marries on uh, out of his own will a uh, uh, woman and then started having an extramarital same sex relationship you know i think then he is not only cheating himself but he is also cheating uh, on the woman that you know it's it's injustice to himself and injustice to that woman also and uh, this is exactly what uh, i have keep facing uh, from many uh, rss people from the western part of india mainly from maharashtra that i interact with because i also a few uh, uh, men that i have interacted with uh, haryana uh, uh, side is that they think that uh, family as a unit heterosexual uh, you know cis het unit should actually uh, keep on going and uh, so it is important for them to marry a woman and procreate and then to have their sexual uh, relationships and fantasies and pleasures outside the marriage with other men specifically i'm not talking about women with men because they are msm there is men having sex with men or these are bisexual or these are per, perhaps queer men who are in denial that they are gay men so uh, and, and this this is the logic that they keep on giving that this is our indian tradition or indian family will always accept uh, if we marry a woman and give birth to healthy children and as you are saying that whether the child will be gay or not they are not concerned of, about that they are concerned that you know they have to run the family like this through procreation and they should also have uh, they should enjoy uh, other ways also i think this is a problem and we should address this so i know that maybe i have not uh, answered your question but uh, yeah i don't know really thank you so Nilesh. much yeah, yeah. Uh, in just just this regard there is a uh, documentary called mardistan uh, i think it's available on youtube i think uh, that has like four segments one of them talk about 
uh, exactly what Gaurav mentioned. I think that's a very interesting thing you could look up about how there's a lot of bi erasure within the family as an institution. I think Mardistan, I think you can look that up. And uh, yeah. I think you and I can always have a conversation later yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah. I tell you why I asked such uh, this particular question. Uh, like uh, in my uh, known circle, uh, so I have observed uh, there is a, like uh, two. They are like much older than me, but they are like siblings. And the brother is like uh, transgender, and uh, his sister never got married because people uh, had like misconception if uh, they like uh, marry their son with that girl who is a normal. She may give birth to the like transgender uh, uh, children, like misconception. And she in this uh, uh, even situation, she never had to got a married. Like Nilesh, my ex was confused gay, and his uh, <laughs> brother is a toxic cis head patriarchal man. And uh, his uh, younger sister is a queer friendly uh, progressive woman. So <laughs> it is uh, very uh, complicated. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma Thank you, Gaurav, for the wonderfully stimulating talk. And I would also like to thank Bhavna and Ekta for facilitating this. Wonderful. I, I completely agree with you because I have seen, uh, you know, people uh, marrying simply for the sake of tradition and, um, you know, finally marriage is being ruined simply because the person could not own up to the fact uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, he had just married simply because uh, of uh, parental pressure. So I've seen that happening. But it is also true that people are coming out and, uh, you know, sort of uh, acknowledging now. And that's uh, that's really wonderful. But I was wondering, you know, if you have uh, given the fact that there are um, there are uh, queer clubs now across universities, has there been an attempt to link all these organizations across campuses? This is one uh, question. And uh, secondly, uh, Gaurav, I would like to know, uh, you have, what you have recounted is primarily JNU experience. So uh, how have the, uh, you know, have the administrations in other uh, universities, other institutions, have they uh, uh, reacted you know, of course, they would not have reacted positively that I understand. But has some progress been made in other campuses as well with the admin at least willing to enter into some kind of a dialogue with, uh, uh, you know, queer organizations? Some effort to make the campuses queer inclusive. How would you uh, um, assess the progress that has been achieved so far? Yeah. Uh, can you repeat your first question? I, I couldn't uh, get the first question. The first question is, uh, given the fact that we have queer organizations and clubs now across various campuses, has an attempt been made to, uh, you know, link these, you know, in, in, you know, in an attempt to build solidarities across campuses? That was the first question. Or uh, are these pride marches, you know, or, or uh, you know, other events being held independent of each other? A general awareness and solidarity acting as that this uh, you know overarching kind of framework or has some real uh, concrete measures been taken to link these organizations across campuses thank you Modhavitadi. i think i have seen you on campus also jnu campus okay, okay. that's wonderful so, <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you for I, the first I, yeah. I, Ganga. So the moment you mentioned Ganga Dhaba, everything started from Ganga Dhaba. So <laughs> very happy okay. to hear that. Anyway. <laughs> so, so your first question is the most uh, important question because uh, I personally uh, think and believe that uh, LGBT struggles in India has not uh, become a movement. Because when we think of a movement, a movement also has political orientations and directions. LGBT struggles in India, they, I would call them so sporadic moments of struggles, but not a movement. Because, uh, because we still are, are fighting within our own communities that, you know, what should be our uh, direction to fight for LGBT rights. And there are several organizations. Some organizations, like-minded organizations are coming together, but there is always a threat from the upper caste and upper class queer people in our community. 
and for example i i mentioned uh, safo for equality from lbt there is a billion organization working in mumbai called labia you know and labia is working for almost 22 years now and labia has been facing lot of problems within the queer communities because lot of people are not uh, accepting or they are, they do not agree what Lab labia says like for example uh, in facebook on facebook we have a group called uh, uh, hindu gay boys you know and, uh, and and these people are constantly saying that we are proud to call ourselves hindu brahmin gay and they, at the moment they are saying that I am queer and at the same time I am proud of my caste identity, it's a problem. And so, so our fight has now become, every day fight has now become to actually fight these right-wing uh, upper class and caste gay people, particularly queer men and women, to tell them that, you know, this is not right and perhaps you have to understand what queer means. We cannot also ignore uh, the histrionic that uh, uh, Lakshmi Mani, uh, Tripa, uh, Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi uh, does. You know, constantly saying that you know I am the Hindu Kinnar Akhara head. The moment uh, uh, she says that, you know, what happens is that we completely ignore the transgender histories from the Sikh community, from the Muslim community from the uh, tribal community. You, we completely ignore that long history that India has, that, you know. Uh, so, so these are the uh, dangers that we are right now facing. And that's why I said that post section 377 and what is to come, this transition period is very important because as you said, that there was no uh, concrete and structured efforts taken to actually join all these organizations. And when I say all organizations that include the uh, right wing, left wing, and center, so a lot of queer organizations have their own uh, political stance. I'm saying that irrespective of that, they all have to come together and fight for some basic rights. Like in the parliament, when Shushma Swaraj, Vrinda Karad, and Sonia Gandhi held hands together for 33% of reservation for women parliamentarians in the Indian parliament, they have done it going beyond their uh, political uh, affiliation. So these organizations should also come, but there was no such con constructive effort taken. I don't think uh, it is now happening because the danger is that constantly these upper caste and upper class square folks are saying that uh, gay uh, movement or struggles in India has been hijacked by the feminists and left feminists. It is now their duty to rescue that and give it back to the Hindu because they now say that it is only Modi who actually made 377 go. So Hindutva is for gay people. It is our duty to rescue the gay movement from the hands of left feminists. And they are becoming extremely organized and powerful every day. And particularly, this is happening from the western part of the country. And it is actually slowly uh, evolving and moving very fast. This is one. And um, the second question you asked, I, I've, uh, about, about, you have to unmute yourself. So uh, we have a question later, but I was just wondering uh, if you are, you know, Hindutva doesn't, the fact that Hindutva is also uh, about being patriarchal, you know, it doesn't remain uh, Hindutva really if it acknowledges, um, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it queer uh, politics. So I was wondering if there is a, a disconnect there. It sounds a little odd uh, to me, but um, uh, the, the second thing is that do you really think that the gay cause, uh, the queer cause is being harmed because uh, there are these other politics of class, caste, etc. Do you think that for a moment at least these other politics need 
to be put put, put aside and uh, you know just speaking on behalf of uh, queer politics without trying to sort of integrate with the other uh, you know uh, intersectionally speaking with other kinds of interest do you think that is going to serve the purpose is no. just destroying no. <laughs> no i do i i don't think that is going to serve the purpose and i don't think we should at all uh, think like that because uh, uh, we have to think and i keep i keep on giving this example because i have heard someone like this what happens if there is a dalit muslim uh, queer woman from one of the villages of of haryana so that person has so many markers of identity and these are very important markers of identity like muslim uh, dalit woman and at the same time lesbian and let's say also uh, uh, middle class or lower class so uh, i think these are uh, important uh, uh points that we should keep in mind and we should address because uh, a few years back there was an advertisement in times of india's matrimonial page uh, in bombay where uh, one uh, person have advertised for uh, her uh, son's uh, marriage saying i want a groom for uh, my son from this caste you know and later when we asked that man that you know why did you say that my grandmother who was 80 years old she has accepted me and said that okay i would want you to marry but i would want you to marry to the higher caste or guy only and then we had to tell him that you know you if your grandmother at the age of 80 accepted you as a gay boy the gay grandson your grandmother at the age of 80 would have also accepted your partner who perhaps not from your caste yes. how could you you should have gone into that kind of a dialogue with your grandmother Absolutely. so 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 the, so the caste issue we have to accept we have to because uh, when tripathi does that kumb snan we cannot ignore her upper caste surname you know and yeah. that enter histrionics of a hindu saint kinnar saint you know and having all the followers like it is nothing but giving a strong message of hindutva ideology in which the country is now facing Absolutely. so we have to look at these not, not as disjointed incidents but all very much clapped together within that uh, thread that we are all facing i completely agree with you. Definitely. But the second point is about uh, the uh, university administrations, basically. Yes, what yes, is yes. A new experience. How about the other uh, administrations across other campuses? Has some progress been made there? Um, yeah. So, 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 uh, yeah. So, Madhuri, today, like, uh, <laughs> any university administration is anti-student. Yes. Some some are very anti, some are mild anti, some are very very mild anti, but they are generally anti-student. It depends on what uh, departments and what uh, kind type of university you have. For example, Ashoka University is uh, which is now in the news, is a liberal university. So we have a particular group of people, students coming there and studying. So the administration will be also a bit different. So to have a, a gender sexuality club there or have a Ashoka University queer collective would perhaps be easier rather than having it in, let's say, Osmania University or Aligarh University or in, uh, let's say, BJP run universities. It would be very diff uh, difficult. Uh, very interestingly, uh, right wing has its own version of queer uh, self, you know, and queer identities. I don't know if you have remembered from your day new days but there was this one man who used to come called oma and uh, oma and uh, and and oma used to give uh, oma used to come uh, post 2014 and used to give uh, lectures on uh, from the platform of india first you know so which was uh, started on campus and obviously they have their own understanding of queer the whole understanding is that you should be what you are that is you can have your sexual relationships outside and hidden don't ask for rights don't challenge the government don't challenge religious institutions who are telling you that you are wrong 
so do everything but do discreetly discreetly and secretively so the administration obviously uh, for example jadavpur university i know a few uh, university administrations who are now opening up to the uh, conversation but uh, many universities uh, like for example iit and law uh, campuses you know in india they have been doing the, uh, forming these collectives and constantly uh, organizing uh, queer talks and events so they and obviously they are doing it uh, taking the permission from the administration so i am assuming the administration has opened up to this but uh, you know we uh, like but uh, just imagine that you know i come from jnu which is india's supposedly the progressive uh, university campus you know so when the queer film festival of jnu was organized the administration sent me a letter i still have it you know uh, at that time sudha pai was the registrar and dr sapuri was the vice chancellor and i still have six points from the administration that all the poster should be taken down and uh, you know why the poster should be taken down if, if if all of you can just google search there is a very beautiful film called from beginning to end you know it's about two half brothers and who are queer actually uh, so from beginning to end and from beginning to end there were this uh, queer uh, body two brothers hugging each other like only their chest you know and i was asked uh, to come for a meeting where i was scolded quote unquote scolded by teachers and admin people saying that you are an unfit uh, submitted student how could you print this poster you have not taken into account students who are 18 19 20 years old and on this campus studying the moment they will see this poster they will see think of it as semi porn they will go and watch this film and then it is all an anti indian culture obviously they were briefed by right wing people so and uh, you know and, and the entire support system was withdrawn but but i have learned one thing from my uh, feminist um, comrades activists that is that you should never stop the dialogue and uh, i did not stop the dialogue i i kept on talking to them the administration in particular and after one year as i mentioned you know there is this email coming from the vice chancellor's office you know where sapuri was saying that you know i would actually come next year when i would not be the vice chancellor and uh, i think uh, it is important for us to keep on talking to the administration because we have to accept that the administration and as uh, the general public they do not have the language to talk about queer issues yes, and we yes. cannot be critical of this we have to give them a rhetoric we have to give them uh, a language to communicate with us once we give them that then we can negotiate and then we can debate further then we are both equal uh, across the table to talk about issues yes, so unless yes. until we educate them it is not possible to expect that they would be also very sensitive so completely agree with you gorab thank you so much for your response i guess there would be others we are really you know waiting to ask you questions so uh, thank you for asking the questions it was lovely talking to you but uh, let's see ekta are there a uh, chat box i can no other question so far uh, but thank you ma'am thank you for your questions does anyone so, uh, else have a question no it seems like they don't so in that case you know uh, yeah where is bhavna I'm here. Yes, Bhavna. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then. In that case, thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you, Gaurav. I hope to see you soon in person. Yes. Yeah. Hope to see you and on campus, actually. Yes, on. actually, hope to see you soon on campus. You know, it would be lovely to have you. I mean, really, I I'm really happy uh, that you know we could have this talk. and this kind of an open uh, discussion you know i was really looking forward to something like this and it has happened so yes thank you so much thank, thank you for you. inviting <laughs> thank you bhavna and ekta i think that was wonderful organizing yeah. it this thank Gaur, you bhavna thank yes. you so meet you sometime okay. soon and thank you once again from all of us here for agreeing to do this talk 
I hope to see you guys very soon. Maybe I can come there and perform something. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We do have theater group over here as well. But now because of pandemic, it's all shut. But uh, definitely would love to have you here. And or maybe we can make something and form yes. something together. That would be yes, great. there's something we can discuss. Uh, uh, go up on campus. Yes. Okay. All right. Shalom then. Thank, Thank you. you. All of you stay Thank safe. You. Thank you. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.